Hello, welcome to our channel as Sisters in Zion. Our names are KB, Antonia, and Courtney. We are excited to share our insights with all of you and welcome you to comment below with what you learned this last week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. There are some online resources and communities that are linked in the description below. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Okay, this week we are um, covering Mosiah 25 through 28, and they were called the people of God. <clears throat> I have an insight from uh, Mosiah uh, chapter 26, verses 1 through 6. Um, and it reads, those six verses read, now it came to pass that there were many of the rising generation that could not understand the words of King Benjamin. Being little children at the time, he spake unto his people, and they did not believe the tradition of their fathers. And again, we been uh, here say righteous tradition of their fathers. They did not believe what they had been said, what had been said concerning the resurrection of the dead. Neither did they believe the concerning the believe concerning the coming of Christ. And now because of their unbelief, they could not understand the word of God and their hearts were hardened and they would not be baptized. Neither would they join the church and they were a separate people as to their faith and remain so ever after, even in their carnal and sinful state, for they would not call upon the Lord, their God. And now in the reign of Mosiah, they were not half so numerous as the people of God, but because of the dissensions among the brethren, they became more numerous for it came to pass that they did receive deceived many with their flattering words who were who were in the church and did cause them to commit many sins therefore it became expedient that those who committed sin that were in the church should be admonished by the church you know, come follow me manual it talks about the rising generation president henry b iring of the first presidency emphasized the need to teach the youth of the church to believe in god no charge in the kingdom is more important than to build faith in youth each child in each generation chooses faith or disbelief. Faith is not an inheritance, it's a choice. Those who believe King Benjamin learned that. Many of their children chose late, la later not to believe. The scriptures give, at, give us as a reason for they would not call upon the Lord their God. Speaking of the youth of the church, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles explained why older church members mentor those younger than them so much that we do in this church is directed towards you those whom the book of mormon calls the rising generation we who have already walked that portion of life's path that you are now on try to call back call to call back to you something of what we have learned we shout encouragement we try to warn of pitfalls or perils along the way where possible we try to walk with you and keep you close to our side what were the challenges Alma faced with the rising generation? In the student manual, uh, God's faithful servants seek to do as well. Sometimes we might think that the church leader like Alma always knows exactly what to do. In Mosiah 26, we read of a problem in the church that Alma had never dealt with. What did Alma do in this situation? And what does Alma's experience suggest about how you might approach difficult problems in your family or your church service? What did, what did the Lord teach Alma in Mosiah 26? Notice that some of the Lord's answers were not in direct response to Alma's question. What does this suggest about prayer and receiving personal revelation? I can help others come unto Jesus Christ. Conversion is personal. It cannot be passed like an inheritance to one's children. As you read Mosiah 26, ponder the possible reasons the rising generation fell away. And notice the consequences of their unbelief. You might also think about people you wish you could bring to Christ. Throughout your study of Mosiah 25 to 28, the Spirit may whisper things you can do to help them develop faith in Jesus Christ. So my commentary and, and thoughts on this is why. So they didn't understand the scriptures or understand what King Benjamin or Alma had was trying to teach them. So instead... They hardened their hearts and they became a separate people. And through that, they 
started to have dissensions. And it was because of these dissensions among the brethren that they then didn't want to join the church. Right. This is this pattern of these people. So the adversary prompts non-members and unfaithful members, or what we call inactive members, what to do to the members of the church. In verse 10, it talks about crimes and equates it to sins. Now, we know sin weakens a people and a nation, and crime is damaging to a society. So our government and most governments now are products of some serious sins or they, sh I should say, they protect, not product, protect. <laughs> some governments now protect some serious sins while persecuting others. And it's a deception because then they legally um, legalize some sins. And we know that this quickly leads to the disintegration of a society. So... Uh, my examples here, again, are abortion, you know, and gender changing and uh, pedophilia. Um, they, they are uh, very, very um, hot topics because um, society right now is um, not listening to um, the scriptures, not reading the scriptures, not looking as these People said that uh, their their great error was is that they would not call upon the Lord their God. Um, are we guilty of that, brothers and sisters? Are we guilty of when there's something in our lives that is uh, happening? Do we seek the Lord instead of trying to? Um, do things on our own understanding. That is why he's there. He says to us, I believe it's in Doctrine and Covenants 6, uh, 36, right? I say that in my next insight, you know, to come to him in every thought and every, you know, and every action that we have, we're, we're, we're to go to him. And, um, but these, but these uh, brethren uh, didn't do that. They, they became prideful and, um, it reminds me of the story of, of Laman and Lemuel. You know, they had, not only had they seen um, uh, the manifestation of an angel, they still um, were rebellious and refused to believe. And, uh, and they continued on that path. We don't know what in the end happens to them, other than we know that that is, um, we can surmise that they um, didn't receive exaltation because of um uh, their their um, their posterity continued in the same uh, thought process, and so where are we at, brothers and sisters? Are we um, feeding dissensions among the brethren? I mean, amongst the uh, members, amongst uh, the authorities, against you know the apostles. Do we um, do we backbite and uh, uh, the leadership? Or are we um, trying to separate ourselves in a in a disharmonious way and not along with the with the uh, principles of of the gospel? Um, it says that very clearly. It's because they did not understand. So because they didn't understand, instead of going to the Lord, they hardened their hearts, and then they they didn't just walk away. They then uh, tried to cause problems within the church, which is what is happening now. Many uh, uh, in the church are now speaking against the church in multiple, multiple ways, uh, having to do with tithing is one that comes to mind right now. And also the leadership. They're, you know, they're questioning the leadership because of, of, uh, of COVID and the, uh, all of the the immunizations, you know, the, the vaccines, um, all speaking against uh, the brethren to try to um, um, knock the leadership. So high crimes as far as the Lord is concerned. So, um, yeah, so those were my thoughts. Let's say you, Courtney. I 
I was kind of taken back to when I was doing Sunday school as a teenager. And I don't remember this gentleman's name, but he was our seminary teacher and also helped with Sunday school. And he like spent an hour talking about how the church was always like one generation away from failure or one generation away from losing a majority of the youth. And I kind of remember thinking at the time, this is really traumatic. Like you can't just lose an entire generation. And now that, you know, I'm obviously older and things with COVID have happened and all the other things. I'm like, you know, he was right. <laughs> he was very, very right. And he was very worried about those teenagers that he was speaking who are now in their 40s. He was very concerned. And um, I think rightfully so now. Um, but one of the things he talked about is what does it mean that they did not know? Because their parents had taken part of the oath with King Benjamin. So you would assume that they remained faithful and were teaching their children, but it doesn't necessarily translate the same way. So what was it that they didn't know? And it comes down to they didn't know Christ. Yeah. They might have known the teachings, they might have been taught the mannerisms, but it was, they only let it kind of go over the surface. They didn't let that knowledge change them. Well, I think of, that's a, a very good point. I think you're saying that they, they knew these things because they had an understanding because they're, I mean, like all Mother Younger, well, you know, it's like saying his dad was a was a prophet, and um, so he had knowledge, right? But it says that they didn't understand. So they knew they didn't understand. They didn't understand. It's like you said, they didn't know the Savior, which means that they didn't have His Spirit. And so you cannot, you can have all the scriptures of the world, and you know, and if you don't understand them, if you don't have an understanding. Um, they, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to know, know the Lord. You're not going to know what they mean. You don't have any understanding. What's, what's the point, right? The whole point is, is that they, like you said, they didn't have a relationship with the saviors. Hence, they didn't have the spirit that would give them that understanding. And that is why. And, and, and that's why, um, the scripture says, they, for they would not call upon the Lord their God. That's that quote by Elder Neil A. Maxwell. So you're right. Okay, the next insight I have comes from Mosiah, also 26. But I expand on it a little bit more because this is interesting what happens here, right? So, <clears throat> but King Mosiah said unto Alma, Behold, I judge them not, therefore I deliver them into thy hands to be judged. And now the spirit of Alma uh, was again troubled, and he went and inquired of the Lord what he should do concerning this matter. For he feared that, feared that he sh should do wrong in the sight of God. Okay, so. Let's see, Alma is given all of these people that are uh, sinning or trespassing God's commandments, right? But a lot of these people are non-members or non-believers and inactive members. So he gives them to King Mosiah. But Mosiah says, no, they belong to you to judge you know you're the spiritual so this is very clearly how they're how they're <clears throat> separating um church versus state here 
So God's faithful servants seek to do his will. Sometimes we might think that a church leader like Alma always knows exactly what to do. In Mosiah 26, we read of a problem in the church that Alma had never dealt with. What did Alma do in this situation? What does Alma's experience suggest about how you might approach difficult problems in your family or church service? What did the Lord teach Alma in Mosiah 26? Notice that some of the Lord's answers were not a direct response to Alma's question. What does this suggest about prayer and receiving personal revelation? So in Doctrine and Covenants 42, verse 79, it says, And it shall come to pass that if any persons among you shall kill, they shall be delivered up and dealt with according to the laws of the land. For remember that he hath no forgiveness, and it shall be proved according to the laws of the land. So here clearly we're learning the difference between spiritual and, and um, governmental or temporal, i.e. Um, the law of the land. In D&C 636, I, uh, I quoted earlier, look unto me in every thought and doubt not, fear not. So how does the Lord respond to Alma? Alma says that he doesn't want to do, he feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God. So he's a little bit, com, you know, conflicted. He doesn't want to make the wrong decision. So what does Alma do? So Alma goes and he prays to the Lord. And the Lord answers him. It's kind of a twofold that the Lord answers him. So in verse 15, the Lord answers him and he says, Blessed art thou, Alma, and blessed are they who were baptized in the waters of Mormon, meaning those were the ones that, before they went to Zarahemla. Right? It goes, he goes back to tell him that, not the people that he's now with. Thou art blessed because of thy exceeding faith in the words alone of my servant Abinadi. And blessed are they because of their exceeding faith in the words alone which thou hast spoken to them. And blessed art thou, because thou hast established a church among this people, and they shall be established, and they shall be my people. Yea, blessed is this people who are willing to bear my name, for in my name they shall be called, and they are mine. And because thou hast inquired of me concerning the transgressor, thou art blessed. Thou art my servant, and I covenant with thee that thou shalt have eternal life, and thou shalt serve me, and go forth in my name, and shall gather together my sheep. So here's very clearly his calling and election is made sure. Okay. So the first thing to Alma's pleading to the Lord of this circumstance, he's like, he has to judge these people. He doesn't know what to do with them. He sends them to the king. The king says, no, this is something that you have to deal with in the church. So now he's like, well, not wanting to make the right, the wrong decision. So probably, you know, he was thinking of his past, you know, when he was an evil priest under the King Noah, you know, maybe he was feeling like a hypocrite or maybe wondering where he went wrong as a parent, you know, because his, his son was one of those and he was persecuting the church. And so, you know, who knows where Alma was in his thought process, but the Lord clearly wants him to know that he is accepted of the Lord and that he is redeemed. And the fact that he is seeking the Lord to make sure he makes the proper decision, the father then again tells him, you know, because thou hast inquired of me concerning the transgressor, thou art blessed. So he is again, as Alma um, is seeking him to make the right decision, he is then given the confidence by the Lord. So what he's to do next, right? This is what he's to do next, right? He says that he shall gather together his sheep and he will hear my voice. And he that will hear my voice shall be my sheep and him that shall, he, ye shall receive into the church and him I will also receive. For behold, this is my church. Whosoever is baptized shall be baptized unto repentance and whosoever ye shall Believe in my name and him I will freely forgive. 
For it is I that taketh upon me the sins of the world, for it is I that hath created them, and it created them, and it is I that granteth unto them to him that believeth unto the end of a place at my at my right hand. For behold, in my name are they called. And if they know me, they shall come forth and shall have a place eternally at my right hand. And it shall come to pass that when the second trump shall sound, they shall that knew me, that never knew me, come forth and shall stand before me. And then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, that I am their Redeemer, but they would not be redeemed. And then I will confess unto them that I never knew them, and they shall depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Therefore I say unto you, that he that will not hear my voice, the same shall ye not receive into my church, for him I will not receive at the last day. Therefore I say unto you, go, and whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth against me, him shall ye judge according to the sins which he has committed. And if he confesses his sins before thee and me, and repenteth in sincerity of his heart, him shall ye forgive, and I will forgive him also. Yea, as often as my people repent, will I forgive them of their forgive them their trespasses against me. And ye shall also forgive one another your trespasses, for verily I say unto you, he that forgiveth not his neighbor's trespasses, when he says that he repents, the same hath brought himself under condemnation. Now I say unto you, go, and whosoever will not repent of his sins, the same shall not be numbered among my people, and this shall be observed from this time forward. And it came to pass when Alma heard these words, he wrote them down that he might have them, that he might judge the people of that church according to the commandments of God. And it came to pass that Alma went and judged those that had been taken in iniquity according to the word of the Lord. And whosoever repented of their sins and did confess them, them he did number among the people of the church. And those that would not confess their sins and repent of their iniquity, the same were not numbered among the people of the church, and their names were blotted out. And it came to pass that Alma did regulate all the affairs of the church, and began, and they began again to have peace and prosper exceedingly in the affairs of the church, walking circumspectly before God, receiving many and baptizing many. And now all these things did Alma and his fellow laborers do who were over the church, walking in all diligence, teaching the word of God in all things, suffering all manner of afflictions, being persecuted by all those who did not belong to the church of God. And they did admonish their brethren, and they were also admonished, every one by the word of God according to his sins, or the sins which he had committed, being commanded of God to pray without ceasing and give thanks in all things. So Alma was to... judge them this here is where he's establishing you know um how they um were to run the affairs of the church meaning that you have the opportunity to repent these are your sins what say you well you either confess them or you didn't and um, um i think this was done so that it's on record that they had those opportunities and that they did or did not, ref, you know, refuse to um, to repent and walk that path. And um, we know that here it wasn't asking for perfection because it said here the father said that as many as as many times as they would repent that he would forgive them. And um, that just shows a endless mercy and love that the father has. So um, Alma looked to the father for this and didn't doubt and wasn't fearful. He was concerned to making the right decision. Do we find ourselves in that position? Do we go to the father when we have uh, situations that we don't know what to do? Do, do we confess um, if there's sin in our life that has caused us to put ourselves in this predicament? Um, do we acknowledge that that we needed um, to consult with the Father before um, being in that situation? Because that's also part of Repenting is not just, oh, I did this, 
but more what did you do to get yourself there so that it's not repeated um that's true um repentance or at least um part of the repentance process um i love the example of of um alma because he was very humble he wasn't like uh, most leaders they want to um judge and and condemn and immediately um, um, judge and decide you're you're doing this and you're like off to be banished. Mm. And Alma was more concerned about offending God and um, um, and and probably was in that frame of mind because of where he came from and where his past had led him. And he was very um, aware of that. And so um, I love that we have these, these wonderful examples to, uh, to teach us um, how to walk this journey. Let's say you, Courtney. Such a good insight. I think that what really stood out to me um, is actually a conversation we had about this during our family scripture study. And the question posed was, why do we see so many examples in the scriptures of the prodigal son? Both those who return to the church and those who do not. Like it's it's everywhere. You can see what happens to those who follow God's plan, what happens to those who choose a different path and return, and what happens to those who choose a different plan and do not return. And we talked about why is Heavenly Father placing, <clears throat> excuse me, such an emphasis on kind of like these three groups of people like in every book in the Book of Mormon, and obviously several times in the New Testament, you always get to see the parable of the prodigal son. And I think it's, it must be so difficult for Heavenly Father, I think, to kind of watch us. So one of our chickens recently hatched uh, her own two chicks. So she sat on them for 20 days, they hatched and um, it's so interesting to watch that process. So our hen ripped out all of her belly feathers because that's what they do so they can keep like that hot warm on the eggs. She wouldn't eat, she wouldn't drink, um, all of these things, right, to hatch her eggs for three weeks. And then once they were hatched, She's super protective of them. She won't let any of the other chickens or turkeys or ducks near them. She is always watching for like aerial predators. And what's interesting is she has all of these different clucks that she gives them. So she has this little cluck that she does when she wants them to come near her and she spreads her wings and the chicks run under her. And she has a different cluck when she's found something really good for them to eat and she'll scratch and she'll make this cluck and they'll come running over to see what she's eating. And I thought about all of the sacrifice our hen had done for like these two baby chicks because she had seven eggs, right? And she only had two that made it through that entire process to being born and living with, you know, 24 hours. And every time she's worried about her hens, all she does is make this sound, spread her wings, and those chicks run under her. Like, it doesn't matter if it's that it's starting to rain. It doesn't matter if she doesn't like that there's one of the other chickens that's going to walk by. Like, she makes that noise. She spreads her wings and she gathers her chicks. 
And it has been so eye opening to me to see not only how much she loved these little eggs that she would go without food, without water, that she would rip out all of her feathers trying to make a good nest for these chicks so that they would hatch. And then just her dedication to them, to their safety, to their growth. And every time I see her do that, I have that scripture um, come into my mind about and how I would have gathered you under my wings like a ch like a hen with her chicks. And this hen is, can you still hear me? Sorry, my hen died. Hold on. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, so this hen is actually a very special hen to us. So last year, she had wanted to have chicks as well. And we had our dog out at the farm. And she was sitting on her, her eggs. Um, but she decided that our dog was a threat. So our dog is like 110 pounds. And she is a big, large guardian breed dog. And this hen was so concerned that the dog was out there on a leash sitting next to me that this hen actively attacked this dog three different times. <laughs> Ran at it, pecked at it, like did the feathers flying at it. So a chicken obviously is maybe eight pounds. So in defense of her eggs last year that she was trying to hatch, she took on a predator that was at least 10 times her size. And the dog, even though I had it on a leash after it was being jumped on by this chicken, did snap at her. And she got a puncture wound where one of the, like the sharp canine teeth like went all the way through and all the way back out. And so we brought the chicken back to the house and we had to get her back to health and she was on antibiotics and we had to wash out the wound. And even then the vet was like, you're probably going to lose this chicken. Like it literally had a sword run through it, <laughs> but we just, we kept working with her and she recovered and she healed. And so to see her actually be a mom this year has brought me so much spiritual knowledge because I think back to what did she do to defend last year? You know, we're told all the time, who should we fear? The Lord is with us. And I'm like, this is a brainless bird that weighs eight pounds taking on a shepherd right and she wouldn't do that today without a doubt if she felt like her chicks were in danger she absolutely would do that same thing and i think about how much love heavenly father has for us and what it really made me think about is because these are little fluffy nugget things right they can get outside of our fence and she can't. So as she's walking along eating, these little chicks will run outside the fence where she can't get to them and then come back in because they're small enough. They just jump through it and come back out. And she gets so worried and so upset and she will call for them, call for them, call for them until they return back to the side that she is on. And I just think about how many times have I thought that I can take on this enemy that's 10 times bigger than me, that I'm going to be mortally wounded. And what I should really do is turn that over to the Lord. He's always there. He's always ready. He's always willing to take our battles as soon as we return to him. And that was kind of the thought that I had 
because Abby, our hen, even though the chicks keep going out on the other side of the fence that she can't get to them, she never rejects them when they come back. She clucks at them. She's mad because she can't get out there to protect them. But once they choose to come back, she immediately spreads her wings and they're welcomed back in. So that was my thought. Lots of farm stuff, but it's how the Lord teaches me is through animals. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I can, you know, I totally relate to that. You know, I have all of my flock here and, you know, I understand it completely. Yeah, he was teaching me. Well, I'll probably save that insight for for a later time when I was making my sourdough and and the things that I learned from that, you know. Um, but yeah, the Lord, however He can um, teach us, He does, and uh, I can totally appreciate, you know, uh, learning from the from the animals. Well, that's all we have for today. Um, thank you for listening and or watching. If you have any comments, please uh, uh, write them down below. And uh, we will see you again next week. Have a great week. Bye.